Well, if you've ever, ever been to a presentation of mine before, I like to keep it very open. If you have a question, ask it, especially when you're on that slide, because it's easier to cover and not try to remember what it was a while back ago. So if you have it, raise your hand. I'll repeat it so everybody in the, the video watching can hear it too. Um, like I said, my name is Steve Onfili. I'm with uh, DNR. I've been there for many years. Before that, I was Extension Forester with Iowa State University. And my love has always been Forest Health, and you'll see that. So. Today's meeting, this first meeting, is kind of the basic meeting on Emerald Ash Borer. So if you want really technical advice, that'll be the afternoon session, okay? Uh, but if you do have questions on that, I'll try to address those and I'll stay as long as we need to answer everything today, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Let's remember a few things and I'll try not to blind everybody with my pointer as I go because it's very sensitive, it's a heat sensitive one. You know, trees get sick just like people get sick, right? But they don't get sick overnight. It takes a long time. So emerald ash borer came into Fairfield. How long does it take for EAB, emerald ash borer's EAB, to kill a tree? What do you think? I hear two years, I hear five years, I hear 10 years. And it really varies, right? We hear anywhere from two to three years on average, we start to see the tree decline. And within five to 10 years, it's dead, okay? And at five to 10 years, that, that community is usually at a full outbreak. So how long has it been here in Fairfield, Iowa? Well, we don't really know. I can look at the original tree that we found and look at the callus tissue, and I can say with relative confidence that it's been here at least three years. It's probably been here for five years, okay? I can tell you when I'm in the library parking lot and I look at the ash tree across the street that it is fully infested, and I could show you all the signs and symptoms on it. So if you wanted to walk at, out there and look at that later, we could do that. So, but trees take years to recover, okay? These are from native diseases not from exotic insects like emerald ash borer. Some things are obvious and some things are not so obvious, okay? So you need to do some detective work. You could go out and you could find something like this. This is an, on an ash tree, what is this? Fungus. It's a fungus, what kind? I should have brought door prizes for somebody who could name this. Ray, can you name it? No. It's chicken of the woods. Yes, it's edible. Yes, it tastes like chicken, okay? But when you see this, you know that there's a tremendous amount of decay inside that tree. It's an obvious problem. It's time to take down this tree. It's rotting, right? Simple. EAB is not that simple, okay? Let's look at this. This is something I suspect we're gonna probably see a lot of. What happened here to this spruce? Okay, if you look carefully at the picture, top half is dead, bottom half is fully green and fine. So this part here was covered in snow and is insulated all the way through the winter. This was exposed through the winter. Remember, Iowa has three native conifers. Can you name all three native conifers? Ooh. White pine. Eastern white pine all the way down to Hardin County. That's the furthest south native population. Second one, Eastern red cedar. Somebody should have named that one. All right, all 99 counties in Iowa, and the last one is balsam fir, just in the tip of Alamakee, Alamakee County, northeast Iowa. Nothing else belongs here, and people get in arguments. They're like, well, what about Scotch pine, Scotland? Austrian pine, I guess? Austria. Austria. You know, Colorado blue spruce. Any hint? Colorado, right? So they don't really belong here, and they don't really make good windbreak trees, and part of that reason is they're not cold hardy. So next week, we're supposed to be in the 40s, possibly 50s. The ground's gonna be frozen, the tops of those trees are gonna think it's spring, and they're gonna dry out and desiccate. And that's what happens here. The top dried out, the bottom is fine. So you gotta do some detective work to see what's going on in your tree. And with emerald ash borer, you really have to look. Okay, and I'm gonna show you what you're gonna be looking for. So typically when we talk about diseases, we talk about the disease triangle. And that doesn't hold true with emerald ash borer. We're gonna throw how some of our native things that we've talked about go out the window. You have to have a host, in this case we'd be talking about ash. You have to have a pathogen or insect, in this case we're talking about emerald ash borer. We have to have a favorable environment. What's a favorable environment for emerald ash borer? Well in this case it would be temperature. Everything except for minus 45 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. We'll go with that right now for 24 hours. So if you've been watching the news and radio, I've got a lot of calls on this and there was a paper, art, newspaper article that came out of Minnesota and was on Minnesota Public Radio. Were we cold enough the last few days to kill the populations of EAB in Iowa? Answer is no, okay? Yeah, shoot. Close, but no. We would need to be 
at that minus 10 to minus 20, okay, for at least 24 hour period of time to see about a 10% reduction in the population, okay? The colder you are and the longer that duration, the more likely you're going to see emerald ash borer freeze underneath the bark of the tree. Because remember, and underneath the bark, it looks like a little white grub or a little white worm. It's a larva. That, that life cycle could freeze, okay? However, that research right now is being done on black ash. And black ash is not very common here. It has a very thin bark compared to what is very common here, which is green ash, which has a very thick, very insulating bark. So we probably need a lot longer, a lot colder time period. Yes, sir? How about purple ash? How about purple ash? Purple ash is one of the white ash. Autumn purple white ash is a true white ash. So it's in between. So the question is also age. And right now there's a publication that I'm waiting, and I can't, I'm supposed to come out in March, and I can't wait to see it, where it looks at white ash, blue ash, black ash, and uh, green ash. And it looks at 15 years of age when the bark is relatively thin, and it looks at 30 years of age when it's relatively thick to see how much difference it is. And I, I did get a little bit of a hint from one of the researchers up in Minnesota at the Forest Service Research Station that the, the temperature difference is only about a degree or two for buffering and insulation, which is minuscule. So cold might have an impact. So if you lived in International Falls, Minnesota, you may have just won the jackpot lottery in terms of reducing the emerald ash borer populations in your community. What are we killing? What are we inside the, tree. inside the tree? What are we killing? All right, I will pass one of these vials around. Get the right one. This guy started to dry up in my truck, but inside here is an adult green beetle and the larva from underneath the bark. And I'll pass that around and I'll go ahead and pass these around now, a little bit early. This is what happens behind the bark. You can see their galleries. They make kind of an S-shaped gallery. And then you can see their exit holes, which is highlighted in pink. So that's where the beetle leaves. We'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation, and I'll show you some more. So we're killing the larval life stage. So in this case, you would have a disease if everything was right, or you'd have an insect outbreak. Okay. So here we're looking at cedar hawthorn rust. So we're looking at a hawthorn, and let's say we had everything right in the spring. Yeah, up close, you can see the rust fungus, okay? So you can look at all the evidence. Why is my tree declining? Usually when I go to a site, and for many, many, many years, I've gone out and looked for ash trees that we thought might have had emerald ash borer, and it was almost always species selection, you know? They picked a poor quality, a bad nursery stock when they planted it, you know? And a good example is Marshall seedless green ash. How many people have that in the yard? The average age for that is 20 to 30 years. It's really bad genetics. It wasn't a good selection to have on the market. Site conditions, you know, is there soil compaction? Is the soil suitable for ash? Which in most cases it is. You know, we have a lot of what we call sentinel trees or trap trees. Anybody know what those are? Have you seen those? We go out there, we go to the tree, an ash tree, and about ankle high, I take a chainsaw and I girdle the tree. And I take off all that bark for another six more inches and I girdle it again. I killed the tree, right? I leave it for, we do this about this time of year, and I leave it for a whole growing season, and I come back in September, cut the tree down, and we peel the bark off. A stressed tree brings in more beetles. So if emerald ash borer happens to be in that neighborhood, it's gonna to go to that tree first. So it's a trap tree. So we have these all over the state, and they've worked very well in Alma, Alma Key County, but they didn't detect anything in Burlington or Fair, Fairfield area. So I've got a lot of theories on why, and we can talk about that later. But um, one thing I've noticed is in almost every instance when I come back, that, that griddle has been calloused over, and the tree is living just fine. I can come back to trees that we never got to, and they're perfectly fine, and they're alive today. And we're talking five years ago, one of them that we left alone because it was too large to take down. That's why we planted ash. It's a very tough street tree. So, all right, keep on moving for the interest of time. We talk a lot about conifer diseases. You know, these might look the same, but they're not. You know, the pattern to decline will tell you a lot. This will be true with emerald ash borer, and I'll show you the pattern of decline. This is a needle cast disease, which is a fungal disease on the needles where the needles start dying from the inside out, bottom to the top. This one, it starts dying, dying from the top and kind of scatters on its way down. This one is air blown. The one to the right is moved by rain splash. So, and I'll show you those up close. 
This is the fungus inside the stomata the where the needle breathes. You can see the black spots. They don't belong there. So if you have a spruce and you think it's dying, you're not sure why, and you pull it off, a, a brown, maybe purple color needle, and you get a hand lens, you look at it, or a magnifying glass, and you see that, you have a needle cast disease, okay? Could be treated. How about this? This is that canker right, that I was talking about that spreads with the rain splash. You could go out, you could examine your spruce in the spring, and if you see that sap oozing out, how do you take care of this? It's pretty simple. You prune it out, it's gone for good. So some things are pretty easy to manage if you catch them early enough, okay? We spend a lot of time talking about roots gone bad. What's that mean? Well, here's a good example, especially in maple and ash. You know, if you plant them too deep, you get what we call a telephone pole effect. You know, you should see a roots with a nice, or a trunk with a nice root flare coming out. Do you see that in this picture? Instead, you see that root that's circling around. What's it doing? It's going to strangle that tree. This tree is on a very shortened lifespan. They tend to die in that 20 to 30 years of age. Okay? And that's all because it was planted too deeply, either when you planted it when you planted it 15, 20 years ago, or when the high schooler was paid by the nursery to stick it in a container and dump some soil over it, let it grow a year in the container, and sell it again. So when you go out and you buy your nursery stock, the first thing you do is you start digging around and figure out how deep is that first root system in the container. Because a lot of you today are going to be looking at trees this spring to replant your ash. You want that first root that's in there to be no deeper than a quarter inch underneath the soil. Okay? Can you fix it on an old tree? And the answer is really no. You can take out an air spade. We can take all that soil back. We can trim off those girdling roots, and they just keep coming back again and again. So, and here's some example of some of the quality stock that Iowa State University got a few years ago. And this is in bald and burlapped. You know, they, we spent a, a lot of money on this. What's the chance that this tree is going to survive? Zero. So as you prepare to get ready to maybe replant your trees, make sure you get a good quality nursery stock to do so. Okay, and we could talk about that more afterwards if you have questions on what to look for. A lot of this is online. Always protect the roots. This is probably one of the saddest moments in my life when I was at Iowa State University. I worked uh, many years with Paul Ray. I don't know if anybody knew Dr. Paul Ray, but we were driving through Ames and we saw this. And I don't like these rings around trees overall. I don't think it's a great idea because you tend to put more than just mulch in there. You tend to put some soil and you build things up and you simulate flooding or compaction, okay? But what they're doing in here, and it might be hard to tell, but if you look closely at the picture, this gentleman has an ax. And right now he's cutting off the structural roots. He already cut off that structural root. And this is one of those things you sit back and you're like, well, do I stop and say something or do we drive by one more time and take one more photograph? <laughs> you can see what I chose to do. <laughs> it was already too late, they cut the road. Um, and can you tell me what happened to that tree? What happened to it? It didn't die. What do structural roots do? They hold the tree up. This thing blew over. We are looking at this tree. We're facing east. We're on the west side. The west winds blew this right onto the house. This tree did blow over a few weeks later in a windstorm. So this becomes a great concern because when you start compromising the structural integrity of that tree, which Emerald Ash Borer is going to do, and we'll show you that in a little bit, that tree needs to be removed. Okay? All right, so just looking at the root system, you know, I just threw this in for fun. You have your supporting roots, and you have your kind of non feeding roots and you have these microscopic feeding roots. So where are your microscopic feeding roots on your tree? Probably not in your yard. If you, have a, if you have a silver maple, they're probably twice the height of the tree away from your yard, somewhere else. So if you got one of those deep root fertilizers, you're probably never hitting the root that you wanted to feed anyhow. Save your money. Our soils here are very, very rich. Are yes, sir. Mycelium -like? Are they mycelium-like? Yeah, very similar, very similar. I can see where that would be. So one of the best things you can do for your tree is mulch, okay? No more than three inches. I don't know where mulch volcanoes came from, okay? And let's remember this, never put it up against the trunk of your tree. Leave it at least six inches away. And everybody asks me, Tivone, what about the weeds that grow in between? Pull them. Are we that lazy? How many people in here have mulched? When you get weeds in that mulch, 
after a couple of years of mulching, it pulls out like nothing. It's like butter, right? It's very, very easy. But keep that away from the trunk of the tree. The same thing that's going to decay that mulch will decay the trunk of the tree. It will become moist there. Let's expand the life of this tree. How far out can you go? There's no such thing as too far. Mulch as much as you want of anti-turf grass. Okay? This is kind of an interesting article, and we're going to go right into Emerald Ashbore right after this, but I wanted to show it real quick. In 1939, a professor at Iowa State University published an article in the Ames Forester. And I caught this in, at Iowa State University when I was extension forester, and it kind of blew me away. He took an old um, sugar maple on campus there, and it's still there. He decided to mulch half the tree, okay, and not the other half, and came back after two growing seasons and then did something that nobody could do today. He x-rayed the soil. I don't think anybody would allow us to throw that kind of radiation just through central campus. And you could see what happened underneath the mulch. After two growing seasons, look at all of the fine feeder roots, okay, versus what's underneath turf grass. So if you want a healthy tree, simulate the forest floor mulch. So as, if you, as you get ready to replant, remember the mulch and do it properly. And your tree will do so much better. Okay. All right, but no matter what you do, healthy trees will still be at risk because of emerald ash borer. This is probably the most famous picture of emerald ash borer because if you look very closely, what's the date on the penny? 2002 was the year that it was found in Detroit, Michigan. So beautiful insect, bright metallic green. And I get a lot of phone calls from people saying, Tivon, I caught one. It was on the base of the tree. It was on the ground. And I always ask them to put it on a penny. And it's almost always bigger because it's a tiger beetle or it's something else. So if it's bigger than Abraham Lincoln's head by very much, it's not emerald ash borer. Okay? I've been to a lot of infestations, um, including Detroit, Indiana, all over the place. I've seen them emerge. And I've never seen so many where I walk out and I'm like, wow, I'm just covered. I've never seen that scenario. They're very elusive, okay? They do attack white, black, and green ash. Those are our most common in the Sphere area. They are a primary killer. It doesn't matter if your tree is stressed or healthy. They will definitely go to a stressed tree first, but they will kill both. So um, once again, like I said, they were seen in the first in the summer of 2002 in Detroit. This is the native range of ash in the United States. So it's going to move. It's going to spread. It's going to continue to move. Here's what ash looks like if you're not familiar. We have opposite leaves. Here's our bud. So we have a compound leaf. I think everybody knows the seed. If you have white ash, you tend to see this, this mite that causes that little, little gall-like structure. And there's the buds, very common. And here's what emerald ash borer looks like up close. And if you were to lift up these wings right here, what color do you see underneath there? Does anybody know? See the color purple, which is why you see those great big plastic corrugated purple traps that we used to hang around the state. And we may still hang some of them up. They're not real effective. But you know, there's some thought that they're attracted to certain colors, purple being one of them, lime green being another. So they do have a purple under, 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 um, under their shell. We do not have a lure for them. We do not have a pheromone. For gypsy moth, I could put a pheromone string in there. If gypsy moth is in the area, they're gonna go in this trap and get stuck there forever. And I can tell you if it's in the area. We do not think that emerald ash borer at this time produces a pheromone, which makes it extremely difficult to detect, okay? This is the larva, we just passed it around. So underneath the bark, it's not gonna be quite this big yet, but um, you will see these beautiful bell shapes, see that? At the tail end section of it, so here's the head. This is pretty distinctive to the emerald ash borer group. There are other brood pested beetles that'll have this, but emerald ash borer is definitely one what makes it a little bit more distinct are its galleries. So if we went outside and we were to peel that tree across the street, we'd probably find something like that inside there this time of the year, okay? What time do they leave the tree? Late spring, early summer, depends on the temperature, but you know, probably in June. This is not 
emerald ash borer. So if you're peeling your tree, you might run across this. This is a flat-headed apple tree borer, but see there's no bell-shaped curves. Um, so you can easily rule them out by just looking at them. When I drive around, this is one of the things that will catch my eye. You'll see a simple split. And if you look closely on this split, it's open a little bit, and there's galleries right there, and they're S-shaped. And if you open up that split, you can see what it looks like underneath. That's emerald ash borer. That's what you're seeing on that log sample that just went around, okay? Classic, classic. Um, potential spread for emerald ash borer is pretty simple. We have natural spread. Adults can fly. Anybody know how far they can fly? There's a lot of arguments on it. How far can they fly? Two miles. Two miles, okay? Literature says one to two miles. With a good gust of wind, you might get as much as three to four, maybe five miles at most. But they don't travel very far on their own, okay? Artificial spread, number one, firewood, firewood, firewood. People love to move firewood. My gut feeling is Fairfield got it because of firewood. that moved down 34. I'm looking at Creston very closely. Not sure how they got it. Firewood is an option. I don't know, maybe it's the BNSF train. Maybe some hitchhikers got on the train. There's so many options for artificial movement. Um, infested logs. But luckily for us, after it was found in Michigan and Indiana and a few other states, the, the market for ash bottomed out. There's no value to it. So there are very few mills that are gonna, they're gonna harvest it for logs right now. Uh, the movement of infested nursery stock. How many times have you went to nursery and found ash for sale these days? If you see it, I'd walk out of that nursery because I would not call that a reputable nursery. They should not be selling ash unless it's for uh, forestry practices where you want it to die out at a certain age. We call it a nursery. Okay. The other thing you might see, and that was highlighted on that bark sample that I sent around, is an exit hole that looks like a capital letter D. See that? Because they are flat on one portion of their body. And it can be orientated any way. Okay? But they are not the only D-shaped or flat-headed bore. There are many native ones that make the letter D exit hole. So if I saw that, I would look for a few others. I see a hand up, so let me get the question quick. I think it got spread because the city goes out and cuts down all these dead trees, and they grind it up, and they put it on the free mulch pile. So everybody come get some free mulch and spread the cancer. And I think that's probably one of the so, things spread it. People just come up with their pickups. The comment from the audience is it could be being spread through mulch. You have this free mulch that could be picked up and spread, and that's very possible. We'll talk about what the quarantine means. So we'll get to that, and that's very possible. All right? So... Thinning crown, I kind of like this, but ash have been thinning for many years. It's ironic that I'm actually here talking about emerald ash borer because my research at Iowa State University was on insects that carry all of these bacterial diseases that kill ash. And now I've got the ultimate insect that just kills it itself. So ash have been declining from all these bacterial diseases, but typically I'll see, usually it's that center branch, four to six inches in diameter, will be the first one to decline. Okay. You might see that bark split, but in Iowa, it's not very diagnostic. You can see it here where that split was. Once again, if we peeled it off, we'd see those galleries, but here it calloused over. So in Burlington, where we know it's been there for many years, it was so hard to find because as soon as we dropped those branches and I took my draw knife to it and I started to peel it and the bark fell off, you could see, wow, this tree calloused over within a year. It was hiding. The trees covered it up very well because they're amazing. So I just can't. The trees, still infected? The, the trees are still infected. Yep, the trees were still infected. That was the question. They were calloused over. They calloused over the wound, and we found them, and we could find them. And that was kind of the strange thing. We, you know, typically when did I say they emerge? The adults come out, and usually in June. We found them July, August, September, October. I wouldn't expect a sea larva in there, especially in every size we did. So it's definitely moving. But if you peeled it back, this is what I really want to see. This is their classic serpentine or S-shaped galleries. They feed in this pattern nonstop. And then all the way, if you, if you peel carefully, if you start to see this and you peel carefully at the end of it, this is what you'll see. 
and just as they get that maturity, they'll make a hole. They'll go in about an eighth of an inch into the wood. They'll finish their cycle and turn into an adult and emerge to that D-shaped exit hole, okay? So there's the larva there. As I'm driving, and this is what you'll see as you walk outside the li library, is this. This is woodpecker flecking. I'll just bring up the term so we can see it. See this white patch? So we've had a lot of discussion with our wild bi wildlife biologists. You know, typically woodpeckers, in this case a downy woodpecker is the most common that's feeding on the emerald ash borer larva. They come in. If it was a native borer, they make a hole, they take out the larva they're eating, and they leave. So why are they making these big white patches? Why are they flecking off the bark? So a lot of our wildlife biologists are of the opinion of it's not a native borer. It's making kind of a, a different sound. It's resonating a sound that they're not familiar with. So they're not sure if they want to eat it or not. So they fleck off that whole area, and then they make their decision, yep, that sounds good to eat. And that's the hole where the woodpecker went in. And there's another one there, 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 over here, over here. And when I see an ash tree that's got multiple areas where the woodpeckers have flecked off patches of bark like that, that to me is my first stop. I get out, get my binoculars out, and then I start looking for those cracks. Anything that looks remotely like a crack that we talked about. If I see a branch with a crack, that's the branch I went taken down, and I'm looking at what size, what branch diameter? Four to six inches in diameter. I need a live branch, I take that down to the ground, I take a knife and I peel it back slowly, and this, right now, I would find larvae in there. I would find those this time of year. Yes? So you'll always see a crack? You won't always see a crack, because you'll steal over it, but if you can, if you could see something that looked like maybe an old crack, uh, you don't always see it. If you grab this spot right now where it was white, if we went over there and we took a branch down where it's completely white and you can see where the woodpeckers were, you'll definitely see a gallery it's a matter of whether the woodpeckers are hungry enough this year that they pulled out the larva already, or is there still some in there? Chances are there's quite a few in there. We have, we noticed we have more woodpeckers than we normally have so far. So you've said you noticed that you've had more woodpeckers than you normally have. You know, Wisconsin has uh, spent quite a bit of money tracking emerald ash borer by tagging downy woodpeckers and following the population of where they move. So that would make sense. And I know Casey Chadwick with the city of Burlington, the city forester, he said he's seen more downy woodpeckers there than he's seen in his life. And they're there because they have a free lunch. So it wouldn't surprise me. All right. So this is the current quarantine map for Emerald Ash Borer. And if you look at Iowa, we have white counties and yellow counties. The white counties are quarantined. And the red dots are areas that we have found it. So Creston is not officially quarantined yet because we are debating how we're going to quarantine the state. And I'll explain that in just a moment on the next slide. If you notice, Missouri has a blue line around it, and all of its counties now are white. Because this last year, they threw in the hat and they quarantined the whole state. Wood is free to move within the state of Missouri, which is kind of bad news for Iowa because they can move right up to the border, anywhere in here, and bring up infested ash material, and it's here, okay? Minnesota, you know, we can see the one in Houston County here. This is up in the St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis area. And so Illinois, it's almost all. Next to Lee County isn't quarantined yet. So they're getting close. So everybody's got a little different quarantine. You just have to become familiar with it. But in Iowa, there's also one other thing you always have to remember. Can I cut firewood? Well, let me go to the next map. It's a little bit easier. This is our quarantine right now, okay? We're in Jefferson County. We have a find. Can I cut firewood in Jefferson County and drive over to Louisa County? Yes. Yeah. The only thing I need to do is in 2010, there was an emergency firewood order that says I must carry a receipt with me, okay? Even if I harvested it myself. And that receipt says that I, T. Bone Feely, on this date, Harvested this much firewood, you have to have a quantity. Is it a cord? Is it so many square feet? You know, what, how much? From this county, on this date, in this property, and I transport it. Okay? Why do we do that? It sounds silly, but why do we do that? It. Not to track just emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is just one of many pests that we're looking for. And many of you picked up this Emerging Threats document, which is also available online at iowadnr.gov. 
if you hit forward slash EAB, it will get you to that page. You know, but Asian longhorn beetle, which attacks maples, thousand canker disease and walnut twig beetle on walnuts. There is everything that you want to know in this little publication. This is our top five concerns. So if firewood had something else just besides EAB in there, we could go back and say, oh, what's your name? Kim. Kim, where did you harvest your firewood? It's in Jefferson. Could you show me where you got it? Let's see what's going on there. How did it get there? Let's see if we can't backtrack it, figure out where the problem came from, and eradicate this pest if we can, because Asian longhorn beetle is one that you can eradicate if you catch it early enough. It was eradicated from Chicago in the early 2000s. So we have to be very, very aware of what's being moved out there because many things move in there. And the thing that we forget about is we talk about all of these non-native pests here, but oak wilt still can be in firewood. So our native pests can be in there. So there is a big movement. Many counties, I know Scott County and Lee County for sure, um, have adopted, if, if you're gonna stay in their campgrounds, the county campgrounds, you have to bring firewood only from that county. So if you went to the local gas station and you bought firewood and you have a receipt and you're going in there, you have to show them that you purchased it from that county or you buy it within the park. No exceptions. You can't bring it in yourself. And I think that's a trend that we're going to see nationwide just because there's so many pests that can be moved. We're talking about one of literally, well, the Forest Service has a top 20 list. And if you want to see what that is, you can look online. I'll show you where to find it and you can read about what we look for every year. These are serious, serious pests. Okay. So now we're in this tough position. Alan McKee, we found it on an island, Henderson Island over here in 2010. And it slowly kind of crept its way through the woods, just kind of south of New Albany in this area. Black Hawk um, recreation area is kind of where it's at there. Moving slowly as we expected. Then this year, I was called down to Burlington to look at Arbor Vitae. And then Casey Chadwick wanted me to look at an ash tree, and sure enough, we found it in Burlington. And then shortly after that, in July, I was here for a forest health tour in Chautauqua Park, showing everybody how well the community did taking care of the Oakwell problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving out to come to the city hall, and I'm like, I can't believe it. <laughs> I, in front of me is Emerald Ashbore. I have no doubt in my mind this tree has it. It's so called the city, and I'm like, can we take a tree down? And they're like, well, you know, ragbrice come in in a couple days. I'm like. I think we could get away with this with hanging a purple trap, not real effective. And when we got there, I'm like, this tree's really infested. Can I just open up a little area on a branch that was down, you know, about head high? And I pulled out five larvae from a spot about the size of my hand and just a tiny little crack that was re ready to seal over. Okay, so that brought this quarantine option up. Then we got a call from the town of Mechanicsville right on the edge of um, Johnson County or excuse me, Lynn County of Hire, and they said, well, you know, we think we have a tree here. And somebody take a look at it. So we got our district forester, and sure enough, emerald ash borer is there. We talked to our uh, counterparts in Illinois, and they said, by the way, all of these counties down to Lee County are fully infested, and they're going to be quarantined. It's literally right up to the river. And if you're in Davenport and you drove across the river, and I can't find it in Davenport, but you drive into Rock Island, the bark's falling off the trees. They're that infested. So it's just a matter of time. So we had this tough decision. So we decided we would make a buffer around every county. See that? All right, knowing that this is infested, we put a buffer. So now we got the tough decision here. Do we put a buffer here? What should be logical? Well, we got to make that decision because then that starts to, to interfere with Metro Waste Management in Mad Madison County because part of West Des Moines is here. So then do we put all of this area into a quarantine or do we give up and put the whole state into it? These are really tough decisions, really tough decisions. And I don't know that we have an answer for it. We're going to be debating this for the next month. You know, we still have more sus suspect sites to look at and I suspect we're going to be looking all spring. And I think it's probably a matter than a, of a year, maybe two before the whole state's quarantined, to be honest. So the idea of the quarantine is to slow it down and in Des Moines, I don't think it matters. As a citizen of Des Moines where I live, it's close enough to home. It's probably nearby if, I, if, it's, not, if it's not there already. 
But if I were up in Sioux City, where they're running a much stronger percent street trees of ash, their primary ash and silver maple up there, um, I would be a little bit worried. And if I was the state of um, Nebraska or South Dakota, I wouldn't want Iowa to throw the hat in so quickly. But we'll see what happens. It's a very tough decision. So, yes, sir. So Is there any data that says, in fact, that we're having? Is that any effects that we as humans might be able to do in this case can, in fact, slow down the spread of all? Ah, is there any data that shows, in fact, that we can slow down the spread of this at all? And the answer is yes. Um, if we stopped firewood movement and if all of our sawmills that are underneath compliance agreement, basically that means they're going to process all of the ash that they're going to process during a specific time of the year, which is right now, everything's dormant, they're going to take all of that wood that they're not using, that debris, and they're going to burn it, and they're going to kill and dry that wood, make sure that anything that would be inside of it is dead. Yes, we could stop the movement. We can not, not stop it. We could slow it down greatly, greatly. But the problem is, and this happens all the time, every spring, my phone, the state entomologist's phone, Robin Prusner, rings off the hook of, well, we got a truckload of firewood moving outside of the quarantine area, and it came from here. And you got to track it down. And chances of catching it when you get that phone call is pretty small. So, you know, it really comes down to public education, and can you stop it? Well, the speed limit's 55. Does everybody go 55? Yeah, Let's be honest here. <laughs> People that want to skirt the law will skirt it. Yeah, but you have to take into account the fact perhaps the increase in temperature of you know, climatic change, whatever you want to call it, is a major factor of stress on the trees. The comment is, you know, Perhaps the increased temperatures, the droughts that we've seen, maybe this ultra cold that we've seen, these might be all stress factors to the trees, and I don't disagree with it at all. I think that's probably increasing the spread of the beetle in southeast Iowa. Um, however, we knew this was coming. We've been saying it's been coming for years. To me, this is not a surprise at all, to be honest. The, the, the real surprise to me is that we're not finding it in the, in the northern areas, that we're not seeing it in the Waterloo area yet or you know, even the Ames area and, and Des Moines area, that, where the interstates are. I'd expect it to be traveling. Matter of fact, I would expect it in Fremont County before I'd expect it in Union County, coming up Interstate 29 from the big infestation in Kansas City. So Union County, the Crescent find, was a little bit of a surprise. So, oh, real quick before we move on. But if you were here and, and you're driving down 34 and you go through Jefferson County, Wapalo County, and you had any wood going into Monroe County, is illegal. Everything stays. Let's reverse it. I'm coming from Polk County. I'm coming down here. I'm going to go camping. Uh, let's go down here. I'm going to Geo State Park. I'm camping. I didn't use all my firewood. Can I take it out? Everything stays. Once it goes into a quarantine, it is now quarantined. Even if you have a receipt showing where you got it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Let's move on. Asian longhorn beetle. This is the one that really keeps me up at night. You know, I talked, we talked a lot about emerald ash borer. Well, let's keep this in mind because I don't know. I saw the management plan went out. I did not get a chance to see how many ash, 248 public ash trees. All right, so how many maples? A lot more. You know, right now, and the number is moving up as we get better surveys and, and if we get better imagery data. Um, we were running probably about 17% ash statewide for urban communities. What do you think we're running at for maple? Yeah, we're probably in that 45, 50. Depending on where you're at in a community, it could be even higher. You know, 31% maple here? In the right away. Yeah, in the right away. So. You know, if you look at the economic impact that we project, we're looking at $8 billion that Asian longhorn beetle would have on urban communities in Iowa. $8 billion. Let me flip that over to Emerald Ash Borer at $2.5 billion. 
that's a big difference. And these numbers are low because what we did is we factored that a removal cost was averaging $500. Well, reality is it's actually $1,000. You need to double both of those numbers. Um, we went back to Burlington and said, okay, you're taking down trees. What's it actually costing you? Are you getting them contracted out for $500? And the answer is no. Because once the tree gets infested with a pest, like emerald ash borer, they fall apart. And they become very, very, very brittle. And a brittle tree costs more to take down. Asian longhorn beetle goes right to the heart of the tree. Completely hollows it out and leaves. So, but like I said, it can, it can take it out. So you can read through this and all these other pests. But there is, and it isn't just maple they get. You know, it, there, it's listed on here, but sycamore, um, Uh, poplar, London plane trees, birch, horse chestnut. There's a whole slew of other trees that this insect will get. And it's in Ohio right now. So I saw a hand up somewhere. Yes, sir. What larva do you find in the dead elm wood? Right now, you could see a lot of different larva. The question is, what larva would you find in dead elm wood? You would find a lot of different, um, and it varies. So I'd have to see the larva. It would be something native, though. So I haven't seen anything non-native. So if you ever have questions, you can actually, you know, everybody's got a cell phone or digital camera, snap a picture of it, send it in, tell me where you found it. And if you can get it with the galleries too, that helps a lot, but if you can't, I understand, take it into your extension office, they can get pictures of it, put it with a ruler. So here's the size of the beetle. Should you ever see anything like it, there is a native beetle that carries the pinewood nematode, but uh, looks very similar. But this has nice blue on its legs, okay? large beetle about the size of your thumb. So we have some state funds that came through for community assistance and one of the things we decided to do is not just look for emerald ash borers, look for Asian longhorn beetle. We've got all these community inventories that we've been doing for years trying to help communities that you know, don't have funds to prepare for emerald ash borer. So the grants that the Forest Service had out there allowed us to help communities 5,000 and under. So these are some of them. We had 900 maples at the time that I put out for bid, and I said, okay, let's see if somebody's gonna be crazy enough to bid on 900 maples and drive the entire state, crawl up inside these trees with a bucket truck, examine every part of the tree, take off branches, look inside of the wood, and not just talking bark peeling, split it open and see what's causing the damage. Davy Resource Group out of Kent, Ohio bid on all of them, and I about fell out of my chair. And I called them up and said, are you sure? You're bidding on all of these trees, and they did. They flew out here with their, their team of four, and they are um, kind of the lead agency right now in the Ohio outbreak. And they scouted all these trees, and after a month they called me and said, Tivone, give me more communities. We have more time that we budgeted for this. Um, we're not doing this for money. We're doing this to let people know we're an honest group that's out here to find this pest. And I couldn't believe it, so we got 955 trees looked at and more communities looked at than they expected. I was trying to figure out where they were at and who I could send them to and, you know, and so it was actually probably the best money we spent, but I feel pretty confident that at this time we don't have Asian longhorn beetle because we did some early survey work. We are the first state that I know of to do early detection work like that, not follow up because somebody called and said, my tree's dead and I think I got it. We looked ahead of time. And so Connecticut called me and asked, how did it work? We want to do it. So they'll be doing the same thing next year, and we plan to do this as well. Okay, uh, Baroque blight we've been talking about as well. This is a native disease. It's a fungal disease that we've seen since the 90s, and it's been getting worse in Iowa. Um, basically, I'll just summarize it in a nutshell for time, but it, it browns up in late July and August from the bottom of the tree and works its way up. Opposite of oak wilt, oak wilt will start, start in the top, and the leaves retain. You can see that here. See, right now, this time of year, the leaves will be hanging on there. And if you look closely, you'll see the black fungal spores on, on the leaf that's hanging on there. And as the, the bud breaks and the leaf comes out, it rubs against the spores and it's inoculated right away. And so it's ready. If, if, if our disease triangles, if we have enough moisture and everything else, it's ready for that tree to be infected. Curable? Yeah. Um, we, this is a study that Tom Harrington did, and we've done some injections in Des Moines where we used Alamo. Here he used some Arbortech. You do get some burning of the leaves with these chemicals. But I've got some trees now that we're going into our sixth year with no 
symptoms of Baroque blight, it will come back. But for an urban community, it's something that's treatable. For a woodland or for a big park area, I have no clue. The city of Newton took down a lot of trees a year ago in a salvage cut. So something happened where a disease that we've seen in the, our, our herbarium since 1950, what was benign, hasn't done anything, has now become active. And it's killing Baroques across the state. So we'll fly through this. This is a uh, 1,000 cankers of the disease. This is also covered in this publication. This is in black walnut. Black walnut is, I was bread and butter, but it's carried by this little pityothrus beetle. See that? It's about the same size as the letter I on the penny and the word in. So we hang traps all over the state. So one of the things I'm doing today is educating you on this because I don't want people to open our traps. I do trap this very heavily. You may have seen these traps when I show you. Um, once the beetle gets in, a fungus is carried on its back, which usually the fungus doesn't cause, but maybe a tiny wound that calluses over and heals. But these beetles attack by the thousands, hence the name thousands of cankers. And these cankers coalesce into a giant canker and eventually the tree dies out over a few years. And it was on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, but it jumped in 2010 to Tennessee, and 11 it was found in Virginia, and Pennsylvania, now in North Carolina and Ohio, and it just keeps moving. Why do we care? Well, if you look, this is the order of, in order of amount of walnut standing, Missouri, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Iowa. We have a lot of walnut. Matter of fact, we have the most walnut that are in that mature size class of any other, than any other state, ready to be harvested. This is Iowa's oil. So, Something to watch out for for the wood industry. This is a big impact, you can read about it. We trap this beetle using four funnels and at the bottom is a little screw container. How many people have seen these traps hanging around your park? Oh, they're all over in Fairfield, you have to look. Um, inside that is a pheromone packet. This is a beetle where we have a pheromone so I can draw it in. Inside that funnel is a pheromone packet and a dog collar, okay? But it is a dry trap. Other states use a wet trap where they fill it up with antifreeze. I choose not to do that for the toxicity of antifreeze, but um, because it's a dry trap, as soon as you open that, a little bit of breeze blows all the insects out. So our contractors know to close that funnel trap down, take it inside of their truck, open it up, dump it into a baggie, and we sort these minute beetles in the lab all summer long. That's an example of a beetle that is not Pityothrus gigalandus, that's not the wild twig beetle. We found two undescribed beetles this year that are now going into the national collection. So um, something that we are watching out for heavily in the state of Iowa. And this is the trap locations. That's a lot of traps. And somebody said, wow, people care. And I like to see this. People care about the maples. People care about the walnuts. People care about their, their ash, okay? Um, just kind of a strange thing that came up in 2012, and this hits close to home, and I just want to remind people, and this should be our takeaway message, okay, before I take you to the last piece. I got a phone call from John Burder, who runs Shimmick State Forest, that somebody in the Lee County Walmart had Asian longhorn beetle. And Ray, you know this story, I think, pretty well. And I said, really? Why did they know this? Well, somebody went to one of your classes and he saw this and it came in to Walmart in a crate full of backpacks from China. Well, now you piqued my interest. So the telephone game started. And I'm gonna to try to make this long story short. A friend of a friend of a friend had the picture on their cell phone and we got this picture in. And it looks kinda of like Asian longhorn beetle, size of your thumb. The spots aren't quite right. They're more elongated, not circular. The antennae are long. I can't tell if there's blue on there or not. So, you know, it was one of those things. This was a third of July. Everybody's getting ready to leave. You know, nobody wanted to do anything. The sample was collected. Unfortunately, this beetle went across the river into Illinois. If you don't know what it is, don't take it across state lines. It turns out it did not belong in the United States. Um, this is the immediate alert from Plant Protection and Quarantine. It tells you the name of the pest and everything. It's the white striped Asian longhorn beetle, the first record of it in the United States, and it made it into Iowa. It came into shipping crates. 
It was in a crate from China. It chewed through the plastic bag covering the backpack and started to chew on the backpack before it died. And I think it probably died in the crate. It's probably the only one that made it here. However, why do I care about it? Well, not native. It likes cottonwood, walnut, beech, oak, uh, anything in the rose family, which include crab apples, viburnums, beech. Unbelievable. Global world. We almost brought in a pest that took care of everything else that we don't have an exotic insect for right now. So my take home message for this entire group, oh, before we get into this, my take home message for this entire group is you get ready to figure out what you're gonna do with your ash trees is diversify. If you have a maple, don't plant a maple, okay? The rule of thumb is you don't want more than 10% of one species in the, in the community. And you're already over that for maple. Look for something else. And I can guide you to a list, iowadnr.gov, click urban forestry, and you can, there's a list of suggested trees to replant instead of ash. See what fits. Google, see what they look like. It tells you the height, the width, everything you want to know about them. If you have questions, you can email. One thing about selecting tree companies, I want to reinforce, and this is very, very important. Anybody know what I'm looking at? Bonding. Not bonding in this case. That would be for timber buying. This is the, the certificate of insurance. Okay, so you want to see that they're insured, right? And if I can find it here, my pointer. Okay, so why is my pointer not working? One time it's not going to work. There we go. So here's their insurance, but you want to f go all the way down and make sure that they have personal injury and liability as well. They have a million dollars of property and liability. A lot of people don't check that. So if you hire a tree service, they should be fully insured, okay? I prefer a certified arborist, but that doesn't mean you can't find somebody that does a great job that isn't a certified arborist. And in this area of the state, it is hard to find a certified arborist. They should have at least a minimum of a million dollars. What if they decide to drop that tree on your brand new garage, your house, your Mercedes? I don't have a Mercedes, maybe you do. You know, <laughs> Who's paying for that? But the part that people have kind of forgotten about is this personal liability. So let's say they have a worker that they're paying and they get injured, but they don't have that clause in there. Who pays for the injury? Your homeowner's insurance. Make sure that's on there. So if you decide to take down your tree or if you decide to have your tree treated, get a copy of the insurance, okay? A good company will have it with them all the time, okay? Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. All right. Any questions besides what this is? Yes? What's the value of managing and slowing it down uh, versus just cutting all of What's the manage, uh, what, what's the advantage of, what's the advantage of managing ash to slow it down versus just cutting them all down in terms of in a community? Right. How would you slow it down in a community? Give me an example. Okay, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So then what's the point of quarantine it? And that's, that's where we're at now. It's, it became pretty clear that quarantines aren't maybe the best in the world after we saw the Creston um, fine. So there may not be a point, at least for our state. So now we have to look at our neighbors and say, is there a point in slowing it down for them? You know, Nebraska would say, absolutely. I guarantee that. So I don't know. It's a, it's a tough call. Another thing, you know, is it might actually be wise for us to have a little bit of time so we can have more programs like this and educate people that we're not just worried about moving firewood and other wood products because of EAB. There are other pests that can move in there. Keep your firewood where you're camping. Buy it locally. Don't take it out of state. There's a lot of repercussions for doing so. For treatments, there are options. Uh, I didn't put that in here, and we can talk about that all you want. Um, there's one that I really am very hesitant about, and that is the drenchable kind. You can go out to a local lawn and garden s store, mix it in a bucket, and you pour it around the base of the tree. Okay, The tree takes it up, 
It works pretty well in trees that are 15, 16 inches in diameter or less. Um, why would I be hesitant about that? Does it kill other stuff? There are other maybe native beetles, insects, so forth. You know, there's a publication that I brought along that you could read about that's called Frequently Asked Questions Regarding Potential Side Effects for Systemic Insecticides. This is systemic. When you inject them into the stem. Okay, not the drenchable. The drenchable can move. Okay, how close is your well? How close is your garden? How close is some other tree like a linden? You know, our, our native honeybees they don't, they don't pollinate off ash. Birds don't eat ash seed. Hence, the ash seed that are all over there, there's snow right now. They don't really care about them. So, but if you accidentally got some, let's say, in a linden, you're going to see bee pollinate, pollinating bee poll populations crash. Okay? If you got it in a maple, you might see bird populations crash. So you have to be very careful on where that's going to end up. And so, and there's another pu publication that tells you how much you're allowed to do by pouring it down on the ground and a per acre level. We'll talk about that in the afternoon program. And it's not very many trees you can actually treat. You're probably talking two or three trees in an acre. And how do you determine an acre in a city? That's in this publication. Anything above that is going against the labeled rate and is fully illegal. So it's very tough to do. So then you go into the insecticide you inject. And there are several that you can do. They're in a nice little emerald ash borer management option. All right here, publication. There's a midocloprid again, which lasts one year. I'm going to back out of this and bring something else up that oh, you can look at. Um, there's, which is also merit, and there's a whole bunch of midocloprid. There's triaz and triazin, OK? Midocloprid one year, triage is two years of coverage, it might be longer, research is still pending, maybe it's going to be three, maybe it's going to be four, we're waiting to hear. These things you're going to inject, what's the going rate? Well, I've been calling the tree services set up for triage right now, and triage right now is running anywhere from $12.50 per inch of diameter up to $25 per inch of diameter. And the size of the tree determines the rate. The larger the tree, the slower the uptake of the chemical. So how can you make a decision if you want to treat or not, if you're going to do it or not? On here, I just typed in Purdue and EAB, and up there comes the Purdue Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator, and there's an EAB for homeowners. You can literally type in one tree, two trees, how many ash trees you have in your yard. You can type them in. It's going to ask you to go out there and measure the diameter at chest height, diameter at breast height, DBH, okay? Get the tape measure, measure around it. Put in the diameter. If you have three trees, put all three. Okay, and then it's going to say, okay, what option are you looking at? Are you treating one year with one of these, or are you going to do a two-year treatment? Okay, pick, pick your, uh, in your pesticide. What's the going rate in your area? Call around, ask, and then project it out for 10 years. Okay, and it's going to ask, how much is it going to cost to take down that tree? And everybody will give you a free estimate. How much is it going to cost to replace that tree? Put it in there and run it side by side. And for most of the classes that I've presented, and I'll log in for the afternoon um, discussion, I think, and show it, most people's break even is at 10. I'm not touching it at 10 years. It's too expensive to treat again. Most people walk away from treatments. Because remember, emerald ash borer is not going away. This is a lifelong commitment. As soon as you stop treating that ash, it dies. So if you're looking at the treatment option, it is definitely an option for me, personally, if I had two ash trees and they were great health, I might inject one, take the other one down, get another tree started, and then take the other tree down in a few years later once I get some shade. But it's hard to justify the cost. If you're at 30 inches in diameter and you're paying $25 per inch, how much is that? You can do the math. It gets pricey. Adds up very quickly. And after a while, it's just cheaper to take the tree down. You can't inject yourself. No, none of these that are on this list, you can't inject yourself. You have to have a certified pesticide license. You have to have the right equipment to do so. Um, they do cause minimal damage to the tree. Now, the question is, long term, 
If you had to inject every year, let's say you went with one of the midocloprid options and you had to redo that every year, drilling into the base of the tree every year, what's that going to do? That's a good question. So, you know, there's lots of factors to it. So, it depends on which application method you use. I'm confused on the 10 years. I thought the application, they don't last that long. They have to nope. be repeated either yearly or every other year. Correct? Yep. You, so, so so the question was, she was confused about 10 years. You're right. You either have to treat every year or every other year. Most people, when they see how much it costs them at the 10-year point, decide that amount of money is not worth it. And it will reject it because what it does is the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator not only tells you what that chemical cost is, is which is easy to figure out, it's going to figure out what the average rate of your ash growth is going to be. So you're going to have to say if it's green, white, or black ash if you can. If not, you can put just benign whatever ash. And it's going to continue to have that ash grow at a standard rate, okay? And it will know by whatever diameter class you put it in and how quickly it's going to grow. And so that's going to change the cost for removal. And it's going to move that up as it would as the national average is as well. And you'll see that prices go up not just for the treatments but your removal cost. Yeah. So you're also saying that uh, this emerald ash borer is here to stay, and therefore, if any planting any more ash trees would probably be futile. So the question is, emerald ash borer is here to stay, and planting any more ash trees is futile. Yes, it's here to stay. Planting any more urban ash trees is futile. If I had a woodlot, I would leave all the ash trees alone. Because we have Dutch elm disease tolerant trees right now. It's taken us a long time to get them, but we have them. They can get the disease and live with it. So there might be some natural resistance out there, and it's going to take a long time to find it. So if I had a woodlot, I'd let it run its course. Chances are it's probably going to take everything out, but I'm not so concerned about it. So good, good question. Yes, sir. You, you just brought up the million dollar question that we're all wrestling with. Oh. All right. So can we have a natural predator of this pest as well to help the trees maybe have some time to maybe adapt or maybe the predator will slow it down? So there are parasitic wasps out there. Most of those are not native to the United States. As a matter of fact, all of them, I think one are not native. And they have been released in other states. We have been asked the question now, do we want to release these? They are small, size of a gnat. They're stingless to us. They lay their eggs in the back of the beetles. Um, the question is, what other insects are they going to impact? So a lot of people say, who cares? But at the same time, that might be another bird species that's impacted or something else. So you know, I kind of go back to, well, we did talk about soybean aphid. What did we bring in to control soybean aphid? We brought in the little Japanese um, or the Asian beetles, right? Now we have those to live with. Are we doing the same thing if we do that? So I don't know. I'm not sure how much we want to mess with it. And, you know, we often hear emerald ash borer compared to Dutch elm disease, and they're not the same. And let me tell you why. And this is a big difference, and hopefully everybody understands this. Dutch elm disease is carried around by um, an elm bark beetle. And it will invade the tree only when that tree is 13 to 15 inches in diameter. At that time, the elm tree has produced massive amount of seed which is why we see elm trees come up on fence rows and in woodlands everywhere, okay? Emerald ash borer will kill an ash tree as little as one inch in diameter, well before they could produce seed. So there is some fear out there that this insect could truly wipe out the ash trees. And so we have, from all of our state forests, the seed from a lot of our ash in seed banks around the world. And they're preserved. We submitted them years ago just in case this happened. So the theory is if this happens and ash is gone and the areas where ash is gone, emerald ash borer has not jumped to another tree species, it would die. In which case these wasps might be the thing that kills them and gets rid of them and we can bring back ash. So, you know, these are million dollar questions, kind of pie in the sky questions we don't have the answers for. It might be 50, 60 years down the road before we even get close to it. You know, but just in case seeds have been put in a conservatory.
So there is a lot of stuff out there when you look at it. For just one little tiny green insect that looks so benign, right? Yes, sir. I've read that uh, the ash borer will not attack trees that are under 10 years, typically, 10 years of age, typically. I, that they go for more stressed, older trees. That was a, a study that was done up in Ontario, Canada. That's partly true. The, the, the same it was that it typically, emerald ash borer typically will not attract attack trees that are under a certain age or underneath a certain diameter unless they're stressed. Um, but we can also counter that argument. Any tree grown in a nursery container is a stressed tree. Um, for a long time, that's what we use as sentinel trees, those trap trees, is we just use nursery stock because they're already stressed. Just plant them in the container and just leave them stressed that way. And you can just pull the container out. And once you have that big infestation, and we're not there yet. Um, I think when you get into that Rock Island area where the bark is falling off, it doesn't matter. They're going to hit every size class. So you're going to have that wave that kind of goes through. So that wave is approaching here slowly, but it will be here. So we're still early on. Keep that in mind. Yes? Are the trees in Jefferson County only found in the city, or are they found, you guys found them out in the county? The question is, have we found emerald ash borer just in the city? Have we found it else, elsewhere in the county? I have seen it elsewhere in the county. The thing is, we kind of stop looking when we find it in the county, because what's the point? We know it's there. There's so many other counties we need to assist. So what we do is, once you find it in the county, it's a matter of going back to the communities in that county and how can we assist them. So, you know, Ray and a group of foresters from DNR came down and, and did a quick and dirty kind of survey of the street trees here in Fairfield. Now the, the problem we have is, we have Creston to do. How many more communities are gonna pop up and the communities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and there's no money? I don't know. And my next question is, the life of the different type of ash trees, can you find that on the internet? Like, you know, you said some ash trees, their, their life expectancy is 30, 40 years and some are less. That's okay. So the life expectancy of an ash tree, for example, Marshall seedless ash is not a maybe great selection compared to maybe some other ones, maybe summit ash versus some of the other cultivars. You could probably do a general Google search and find a lot of information on that. Um, I don't know of one area where you could go right now and find that information. Largely because I think at the time that we were trying to find more improved cultivars in ash, emerald ash borer showed up. Think about it. White ash just became popular. Autumn purple was showing up everywhere. Um, Champaign County was the next cultivar that was going to be coming out, you know, and then emerald bash, ash borer showed up and nobody wanted ash. So, you know, it could be a factor in your treatment decision, but I would say I'd go to this emerald ash borer cost calculator. You do have to make a fake login. Just It's just a, a username and an ID. You don't have to put an email in. Um, It'll help you make a decision. It's going to be a tough decision for everybody to make, but I suspect most of you are going to say, if you do treat, it's going to be a limited time. I can't imagine very many people that are going to do a lifetime of treatment. So, yes? One of the questions came up when our committee was meeting, and that is, can you, how far underneath a tree can you plant? Can you plant under the drip line if you want to try mm. to get a tree going up so that you can fell the other tree? All right, so how, that's a great question. How far underneath the tree can you plant and still get a you know, viable tree? And that, that varies. You know, if you had a completely shade tolerant tree, you could probably get pretty close to underneath the drip line. But remember, if you have something underneath the drip line of the tree, that makes the tree that you're gonna take down more expensive. It's harder for that arborist to take it down and not damage a tree that's there. So I would say you still wanna get a good 10, 15 feet outside of the drip line if you can. And for many property owners, and I'd be one of those people if I had an ash tree, um, you can't do that. It's a matter of removing the tree and just replanting it. So, yes? So yes, once again, if you go to iowadnr.gov forward slash emerald ash borer, there's all of these things that come up. There's forest health. Here's the emerald ash borer. You can see where we've been surveying. The 2013 data isn't up there. There's community options, but somewhere right above is urban forestry. 
and tree selection. See that? And that'll help you determine what type of tree you want to plant. It's going to be slow. Um, but there's a whole list of trees in there. So sort through that list. And then they're getting, like I said, there's going to be maples because maples are an option. But if you know you have a lot of maples here, don't go that way. Look through it. You want to know it's my yard? I have a silver maple because it was there. I have a Norway maple because it was there. I have a Kentucky coffee tree. I have bald cypress. And I have a swamp white oak. Diversity. And as soon as one of the other maples comes down, I will not be putting another maple there because I know it's in my neighborhood in Des Moines. So. All right, other questions? Yes. No doubt it will end up in Van Buren County. No doubt it will end up in every county in the state of Iowa. Unfortunately, that map that showed where ash is is going to end up everywhere there. Thank you. All right, thank you.